Plus Sports and Plus TV Africa. On a Wednesday morning, you call it Plus Sports and Plus TV Africa. I call it your midweek thriller. My name is Wally Scott. Welcome on the show. At the Testing Balogun Stadium in Lagos State, Napoli striker Victor Osime gives Super Eagles their first goal 22nd minute into the match, while Ogana Karetebo doubled the Nigerian team lead in the 51st minute. Paul Oluwachu, who came in for Osime in the 74th minute, scored nine minutes after. With Tuesday's victory, Nigeria finished the AFCON qualifiers with 14 points and maintained an unbeaten record, four wins and two draws. That is what he can do on a good day. We have consistently complained. This guy is the highest goal scorer in the European League as we speak. Paul Onoachu. And he's never put in a team. If he puts in a few minutes to go. As usual, Genaro brings him in the 74th minute to replace Osime. And he comes in and he scores. And that means I'm only telling you guys I can do it. I've always been able to do it. Put me in first. But it's always Osime and Ienacho first before Noachu, who is the highest scoring Nigerian in any league in Europe as we speak. How can't you give him? If that is, if he's scoring, that is the issue. Put him first before the rest of them. He has gotten more goals this season than Iyenacho and Osime put together. Wow. Well, Paul Noachu has proven to us that he can make it happen. I hope Gennaro can actually rearrange his package now. And let's see what he does next time. We have a major match with the Super Eagles. Manolo Yuri, good morning. Good morning, Emmanuel Ohiri. Morning, Wally. Ohiri is a member of the Manchester City Football Club fan club in Lagos, Nigeria. But let me start with them. Super Eagles with you first. Before we go to your darling club. What do you think about our Eagles? How well do you think we have come so far? After all these years, have we gotten got better? Yes, got Okay, I've got Dele Oshodi Global here with me, all the way from London at this point. I've got, well, well okay, um, Dele, good morning. Dele, can you hear me? Dele, can you hear me? No, I can't. Good morning. Okay, good morning, Dele. Good morning, Dele. Yes, good morning, Wally. How is London this How morning? How is London this morning? Uh, very well, thank you. Weather is okay. Okay. The Super Eagles, last, 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 yesterday you watched the match, you were getting in touch with me, trying to get out to get the match, and now you've gotten the match together. How well would you say the guys have improved so far? Uh, first things first, congratulations to the Super Eagles of Nigeria. The first time in 20 years we saw a return of the Eagles to Lagos. Um, it was a big deal because they had to record a victory, and getting 3 0 on the day was relatively pleasant and good for Nigerians as it were. Um, it's the first time in a very long time that I saw Nigerians score three goals in a match. and uh, Three exciting goals. Uh, I think it was well deserved. I saw a bit of style, a bit of strategy in the team. I was happy when I saw the initial start to line up, uh, but expected more. Most especially, I was happy for Paul Lunuachu, who came on in the second half and got another goal. So he scored two in his last two appearances for the Super Eagles of Nigeria. 
Okay, now I'm, I'll, I'll go to Emmanuel O'Hiri. Um, let's talk to you on this one. Now, basically, I know I shouldn't be asking you a super ego. It's Man City all the way for you, but all the same. South Africans say they are the giants of Africa. Nigerians say we are the giants. Can we boastfully say we are the giants as we speak? So, I will always big up my country. Nigeria is the giant of Africa and football. We have um, boys in prime form. We have Onuachu competing with Osime for a space um, up front. So I think we are more lethal than South Africa. There's a reason why we qualify. Okay, Dele, let me come to you on this one. We have always, we have always continually protested the fact that Genoa is not using um, home-based players. Against Ben Republic, Anayo Iwala came into the game and he changed the complexion. He played against Lesotho and he did very well. You could not identify who was a home-based player and a foreign-based player in that game. Iwala was did as well as any of the foreign-based players. Will this change the mind of Genoa Raw? Um, well, they, if you are in Gallup Raw shoes, uh, you rather go for tested and trusted. Um, I rather stick to the winning team. Um, you can blame the coach. Um, Gallup Raw is of the opinion that um, whether I use foreign or local based players, all, all you guys want is results. Um, Stephen Kessie tried it. He was lucky when I tried it. There are other coaches who have tried it and have failed in flying colors. Um, yes, the inclusion of Iwala in the team, yes, it brought a different dimension and I was happy for the Nigerian contingent. Um, it gives hope for home-based players that they can actually get uh, playing time with the Super Eagles of Nigeria. So Iwala was a good ambassador for home-based players and I wish him the very best. Uh, now, Dele, um, I'm, I'm quoting you this morning because this is something you, we, we talk about on a daily basis. Now. How would you speak for the technical abilities of Geno Raw as a coach? And of course, Joseph Yobo, who is the Nigerian coach, who is supposed to actually get the guys from the Nigerian um, um, league. <laughs> well, you are putting me on the spot this morning. Yeah, yeah, you can only uh, know. Raw's coaching abilities was his pedigree. Um, I don't want to judge. I don't want to judge Geno Raw this morning. That is just asking the inferior of. And the Super Eagles haven't won their last two matches. And then we'll take it up from there. As for um, Joseph Yobo, uh, we know Joseph Yobo isn't uh, a, a qualified coach. Um, he's there in the team for other reasons, for um, leadership qualities, for, you know, there's so many other things that Joseph Yobo can bring into the team as the assistant coach of the Super Eagles. But for Genoa, again, Genoa has been on the Afri African continent for a while. For a while, so I think he understands the terrain. Um, he's been with us for uh, well over three years, and we haven't done so badly, in all fairness. Let's be honest, but I will not talk about his coaching pedigree. Like I said, let's bask in the euphoria of having won our last two games. I agree with Dilly on that one. Let's bask in the euphoria of the win. Congratulations, Nigeria. We will be Cameroon, and I'm sure we will do well. Let's come here now. Inform midfielder Mason Mount has been declared fit. For England's home World Cup qualifier against Poland on Wednesday, that's today, after shaking off a minor injury, now the Chelsea player scored England's second goal in the 2 0 win of Albania at the weekend, a victory that left England top of Group I ahead of the clash with Poland. 22 year old has started in seven successive England games and is expected to continue that run against the Poles. Poland's operations have been turned upside down with captain and record goal scorer Robert Lewandowski having been ruled out with an injury. They have also been disrupted by a positive COVID-19 test, although one of the two players named on Tuesday, Gregor Skiawiski, has traveled after a second test was negative. Southgate also said he would be pleased if new UEFA rules and British regulations allowed for more fans to fill stadiums in England ahead of the Euros. No, he, he, he didn't warm up with the rest of the team, but he, he did the rest of the session after, so um, he should be fine. From our perspective, that's... You know, you're going to have some players who are very hungry to fill that opportunity. Um, you know, they've got some very good forwards, Milik, Zielinski, um, Piatek. Uh, they're a good side with some good players. And I've played Polish teams before. They, they fight for the cause. They're a proud country. They're a good football team. They've got a new coach. So 
they've got high motivation. We all know this is a key game in the qualification group. Um, we've got to keep improving. We've shown a good level in our first two matches this week and we've got to keep stepping up and I believe the players can do that. Uh, well, I guess in the end that's going to be a government decision, isn't it? Um, we'd obviously love to have fans in and I think if it's possible then um, we're certainly geared up to, to be able to hold supporters in the stadium. Um, but we, we also understand that that's got to be done at the right times and um, it can only be in line with all the other restrictions being lifted. Dele, um, Gareth Southgate believes that um, Poland are only playing mind games. Without Lewandowski, he says they are still a great team. They've got Swasek, they've got Selec, they've got Piatek to actually make it happen. So without Lewandowski, he says they are still a team to contend with and their Pol Poland are only playing mind games against England. Uh, whether, whether you like it or not, um, Robert Lewandowski, your hair has gone far uh, from last season, Captain. all across the world, the best player in the world. He won how many trophies? About four or five. In what football calendar year, arguably the best footballer the world has witnessed in the last 15 or 16 months. Any team and every team will miss the services of Robert Lewandowski. Uh, we know that coaches always play mind games when it comes to things like this. I'll do the same. Um, Robert Lewandowski is obviously right now in the class of the likes of Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo. Um, so if he doesn't get to play for Poland, he's going to be a big miss for the team. We all know that. But like he also said, they have certain other players. They have Black Waste, they have Milik, they have loads of players who play for Poland. So uh, it goes beyond Robert Lewandowski. Football is a team sport. 11 players on the field of play for a particular team. Um, Lewandowski can do everything. He can't okay, play coach, Emmanuel, he can't play defense. I'm still coming to you, Emmanuel, on, um, on, on Man City. But however, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Gareth Southgate Gareth says Southgate. he wishes that they could actually make it happen. The government could make sure that more spectators come watch these matches. That he would love it to have the, the, the natural, noisy crowd and not the speakers making noise for him, really. <laughs> it's important that... Um, Um, put 50 first. Um, if the regulators feel that um, at this point, I would say that um, we should tread cautiously to avoid any outbreak. But I would say we should start leading to level two. If we can put okay, now um, Dele, let's come to you on this one. Um, you are in London, and you know how seriously the government is taking COVID-19 and this variant at this point. Uh, you know that. And um, do you think, I have a, a package here before the program ends, about how elated London residents are happy about the tennis courts being open and actually can't play tennis. I'll have a re report on that later on the show. But um, do you think the government would accept um, Southgate's suggestion that the crowd should come back to the stadiums? <laughs> first thing first, the uh, UK government do not play with COVID-19 protocols. Um, the last time I checked, I'm still in quarantine, so it's very, very, <laughs> very, very, very serious. They don't, uh, uh, they don't joke. They don't joke. You're not allowed to gather unnecessarily. Um, everywhere is practically shut. It's very, very serious business down here. I only wish we could apply the same back in Nigeria. I'm um, talking about the football game. Um, it is what it is. A whole lot of people have died from COVID-19 across the globe. And uh, the British government, like every other government, are tired of losing its citizens. Um, so if it's just one football match, there are several other football matches that will come up eventually. So why risk the health and life of the citizens of a country? So hey, football can wait. Uh, COVID-19 has to go. COVID-19 has ravaged the world for well over a year. And we know how serious COVID-19 is. Wow. Now, Man City's all-time top scorer, Sergio Cunaguero, will leave when his contract expires at the end of the season. The Premier League club announced on Monday, March 29th. Now, the 32-year-old joined the Etihad club from Atletico Madrid in 2011 and went on to score a club record 257 goals in 384 appearances, winning four Premier League titles, one FA Cup and five League Cups. The Argentine is the highest scoring foreigner in the Premier League and the division's fourth top scorer of all time with 181 league goals. 
Aguero's most memorable goal was the injury time winner against Queen Park Rangers on the final day of the 2011-2012 season that sealed City's first English title in 44 years. Premier League leaders City said a statue will be erected outside the Etihad Stadium in the Argentine Tana alongside those of his former teammates David Silva and Vincent Company. Aguero he praised on Chelsea club legend Frank Lampard, who he would go on to play alongside for City a few years later, and lethal striker Didier Drogba, who was arguably in his prime at the time. But he also spoke about Chelsea, as the club had indicated the leer of living in London would be hard to turn down. Emmanuel O'Hiri, now I'll come to you on this one. Sergio Kun Aguero, El, um, El um, Sheikh Mansour El Mubarak has said his statue will be built alongside David Silver and um, Vincent's company. This guy is the highest foreigner to score the highest amount of goals in the history of English football. Sergio Kun Aguero. You guys call him King Kun, Man City fans. Before he had scored over 100 plus goals um, for Atletico, he had won a UEFA Super League and then Europa League. Um, we got him for about 35 million, and I'm sure we never thought he would go on to be this colossal for the club. Um, he's been an amazing acquisition for the last 10 years, has given us goals. Okay, now. Okay, now. Let's go. To, let, let me come to you now. Sergio Cunha Guerrero has been miraculous. We've seen English teams players do well in English teams. Frank Lampard and. Um, Chelsea, um, John Terry, Chelsea, Steven Gerrard, Liverpool, Wayne Rooney, and the rest of them, English players. But we're seeing a foreigner come from Atletico Madrid and becomes King Kuhn, a legend in Man City. Not the irregular English players, a foreigner comes to become a legend, unlike other English clubs where English players have their legends. Um, it's relatively hard to attain um, cult status in football clubs, especially in England, because they take their football very, very seriously. Um, Kun Aguero is not pushover in the world of football, but, for, but at the international stage and at club level. Um, Aguero is a well-decorated striker, very prolific. It reminds me of the likes of uh, Romario back in the days. It's the kind of player that in the box 18 will be tied to you if you discard Aram Sergio Kun Aguero. Now, Kunagoro has been a worthy servant for Man City over the years. In the space of 10 years, he's won almost everything. I think the only thing they're lacking is the UEFA Champions League. And for me, it's ill luck. It's ill luck for Man City. Um, Aguero leaving at the end of the season. Yes, I think he's paid his dues. He's contributed his own quota. Uh, we can only wish him the very best. Uh, Kunagoro is what is, in, is the sixth highest goal scorer ever in the English Premier League. But thereabouts is, is of course... The Premier League is going to miss him, and Man City is going to miss him. And it's sad to say, um, you can't talk about Man City's um, history, the way you talk about the likes of Manchester United and Liverpool. That's why you can liken English players, like obvious English players to those teams, or like Man City. Man City blossomed like a flower when money came in, and we all know that. And when money came in, they weren't buying English players. They were buying the best of the best. And that's what happened. Ironically, the likes of Vincent Company, David Silva, and Sergio Kunagero were part of that influx of players who came into England and made Man City what they are today. Now, Dele, no, no, no dissing now. No disrespect at this point. At a point, Man City were always known as the noisy neighbours. When did the change come? The, the days of Aguero Company? There was a drastic change. They were only known as noisy neighbours at a point. And then, bam, they became world champions and started winning everybody. And started topping the league. Um, I think this is general knowledge in Manchester. There are two major clubs. There are other clubs, though, but there are two major clubs, Manchester City and Manchester United. Now, Manchester United was winning trophies 
season in, season out. It was it was a norm for Manchester United at the point in time. And Man City wasn't winning anything. But you know, it's bragging rights. I belong to the blue half, you belong to the red half. And the red half asked the blue half, what have you won? What do you have to show for it? So basically, it was bragging rights. That's why they regarded them as the noisy neighbors. But hey, uh, mind you, can't say they're the noisy neighbors now because nope. Man City have a, I think, they've been nah. over time. Once they get the UEFA Champions League, they'll sit with the best of the best. Daily, I only have a Daily, smile on my face. Smile on my face. But I'm, not, I'm not making fun of you. Just my smile. My morning, my Wednesday morning smile. But um, I, I know you don't have the luxury of this right now because of your 14 days quarantine. I'm not making fun of you, really. But let me read you the story first so you, so you know. London residents were thrilled to be allowed to play tennis again as another sport and leisure facilities were reopened as part of the British government's gradual easing of its lockdown restrictions. One keen tennis player in North London said he and his family had booked sessions on a local court throughout the first week. From Monday, up to six people or two households in England can meet outside whilst outdoor sporting facilities such as swimming park, tennis and basketball courts can be used with shark contact limits in places. Now, despite the move, Prime Minister Boris Johnson urged continued caution due to rising coronavirus cases in Europe. We're, we're here. The kids are the kids are eager, and yeah, we haven't played in ages, so everybody everybody wants to get out there and get as much of it done as, as we can. We've got the entire week booked, so hopefully none of us lose a limb in the process. But <laughs> it's not it's not as easy coming back as it is continuing. But nothing hurts yet, so it's an hour into it. We'll see how it goes. Four months without tennis was a huge amount. Super good to be back. Got a good sweat on, bounce back. So yeah, it was great. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been tough. It's been tough kind of, you know, having our courts closed for so long. Um, having them closed for sort of the first three months of the year is very tough. Um, we would we would normal, ordinarily be be quite busy, even though it's, it's in the winter. We operate a lot of indoor tennis centers and a lot of indoor facilities. So then actually the winter is a very busy time for us. So it, it, it's, it's, been, it's been tough having them closed those first three months but you know we saw such a big um, uplift of, of tennis participation last year when the kind of courts were open again and, and people could play last summer we did see a lot of you know a huge increase in in, in people playing so we're expecting that again um, that again this this of these next kind of two months I think I think all, all leisure providers have, have really really felt it over over the last year um, you know not not just us um, so it, it's been really really tough as from a business sense yes um, but in, and, and you know, you could argue that maybe we, we, we should have been open, you know, to, to allow people to exercise and stay fit and healthy. Um, but it's been the same for everyone, and we've just had to adapt and, and, and get used to it. And, and we've come out now, you know, in a very positive way with with, with open getting our outdoor facilities open. And then on the 12th of April, we'll be able to open all our indoor facilities. So, Dilly, London residents are thrilled about this. We hear that in North London. Practically, practically every sporting facility since Monday has been booked till next week Monday. Swimming pools and tennis courts all booked already. Uh, Wale, you know, uh, we all know that um, health is wealth. Uh, most of these people have been indoors for well over a year. Most of them have put on weight. Um, it's not something we're happy about, but hey, it's exciting times. At least we're going back to status quo. Uh, we know that we'll get to do the things we used to do. Um, basically, people just run, go jogging in the evenings or early in the mornings around here. But it's not it's not the same way it was when they were playing tennis, swimming, you know, playing football. The parks are empty. You know, it's just a whole lot. And it's, just, it's not just about London or the United Kingdom. It's all over, especially the countries who take COVID-19 protocols very, very seriously. So it's, it's good times that... Um, um, it's been eased down gradually. The lockdown is being eased down gradually. And sooner rather than later, um, everything will go back to normal and we'll have our normal lives. Okay, good to hear that. Okay, now, hear that now, some of the good news um, from the Olympics at this point, Tokyo 2020. Now, Australian Open Olympians came a step closer to the Tokyo Games as they unveiled their new team uniforms in Sydney on Wednesday. That's early this morning, the green and gold uniforms designed for what could be Australia's largest ever Olympic team incorporates Japanese original designs and includes a shirt by indigenous artist and Olympian boxer Paul Fleming that features the footsteps of 52 indigenous athletes who represented Australia at previous games. 
Chef de Bichon Ian Chesterman was confident organizers would put in place health protocols to protect the competitors in Tokyo, but felt it was important the athletes did not face too much on that aspect of what would be a very different Olympics. You know, this is my culture, this is who I am. Um, and then being able to represent, you know, uh, my, my culture, my family, um, what we've come through, um, and then following the footsteps of, of the other 52 athletes have already done it. After a year of uncertainty, we can now see the start line on July 23, and it's going to be a big moment for our athletes to be there in the green and gold in this magnificent uniform that's been produced by ASICS for us. As we've heard, the uh, climate in Tokyo is expected to be uh, difficult and we know that ASICs totally understand those conditions and have built an appropriate uniform for us. Uh, it's absolutely world class. Before we go, that was Australia unveiling their uh, Tokyo Olympics uh, team jerseys. Now, in a few weeks from now, we've seen many other countries unveiling their jerseys for the Olympics. Of course, qualified countries already. It's, it's always a thing of joy and a, and a sense of belonging for people when they say that um, I'm an Olympian, I've been to the Olympics. That's the biggest stage. That's the biggest stage you can attain as an athlete. Um, the Australians are already looking ahead of the Olympics. Now, because we know that the Olympics has been delayed 12 months, everybody's trying to make you know rapid changes and obvious changes so that we know that the weight was worthwhile. Um, the Australians are of the opinion that um, these um, new um, attire, these new costumes, would uh, give them a sense of belonging to the Olympics, uh, make them run faster, feel fitter, and all whatnot. Um, it's just the whole paparazzi that comes along with the Olympic Games. You know what it's like. Remember Cathy Freeman yeah. um, several years ago when she came out with her own costume and everyone was wondering, what is she wearing? Now, it went beyond what she was wearing because she actually won the race. If she had lost that race, we would have forgotten about it. But she sure won the race with what she had done. And that's the beauty of the Olympic Games. And this is part of the paparazzi that comes along with the Olympics. Okay. Dearly, Shili Gleba, I want to thank you very much for taking off your, to your time to actually join us on the show this morning. All the way from London. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, on the show today, I had Ohiri, Imanal Ohiri, a Manchester City fan. His um, audio was not very... I promise to bring him back next time very soon to talk about Man City. From the Etihad Stadium, of course. Thank you very much. Dele Shady Glover from London, of course. He took time to actually join us on the show this morning. Thank you very much. Join us same time tomorrow for another edition of the show. On a Wednesday morning, you call it Plus Sports on Plus TV Africa. I call it your midweek thriller. My name is Wally Scott. Till tomorrow morning, like I advise you at the end of every show, if not for anything, at least for your heart, do some sports.